Pentecost. We wish you God's blessings as we worship on a beautiful Sunday morning. We have a number of things to lift out in our uh, prayers. First of all, though, our birthdays. We only have two birthdays this week. We've been having a lot of weeks where we have five, six, seven birthdays, but only two this week. Uh, today, June 26th, is the birthday of Emily Adamow. And they're going to be coming back from, uh, from India uh, at the end of this week. So they'll be home. Uh, Chris and Emily and family will be home this week. And, and so we look forward to seeing them. But Emily is celebrating a birthday um, uh, in one of her last few days in India. And then on Thursday, June 30th, uh, Kate Fuhrer has a birthday. So happy birthday to Kate Fuhrer. And uh, we want to wish a um, uh, happy birthday to those two. Anniversaries, none this week. So no anniversary. Nobody wanted to get married the last week of June. <laughs> Our prayer list, um, Harry Pearson, we mentioned that he had passed away uh, recently. And uh, I did his funeral on, on uh, Friday, this past Friday. And so our thoughts and prayers are with uh, his son Drew and daughter Diane and their families. And so uh, uh, Harry was 100 years old. And not only that, but he, had, he, he was born in Sweden. And when he was a year and a half old, the family moved over here. And when they moved here, they immediately joined the church. So he was a member of this church for 98 and a half years. Um, and uh, uh, so we, we lift up uh, their family in our prayers. Lauren Cook, uh, who is um, uh, still uh, dealing with cancer. Also Steve Heward and Jeanette Dunn, Matt Scruggs, Mary Willock. We continue to pray for Dick Mills, who is over at Liberty Village. Um, Ruth Eckloff. Uh, Noah Morgan, uh, who had surgery last Sunday, is here with us this morning. Good to see you. He's doing really well, so good to see you. <laughs> uh, and uh, we got word Brad, uh, Dale Feist's uh, nephew, Brad Pearson, uh, a great nephew. Uh, Dale and Barb's great nephew, Brad, had, uh, had a stroke this week. He's down at the hospital in St. Louis, but he's doing better this weekend, and his left side had some paralysis, but that's starting to come back a little bit too, so um, we want to continue, we want to pray for Brad Pearson. Also, uh, we want to lift up uh, Jackie Pilcher, your dad, Chester Markowitz. Um, we had him on the prayer list not too long ago because he had COVID, got over that, and I was just going to take him off the prayer list, and you said now he's taking a turn for the worse, he's, they've got him on hospice, and so um, our prayers are with, uh, with you, and with your dad, and, and also with your granddaughter, Anna. We continue to lift her up in our prayers, and we continue to pray for John Purvis. So those are, that is our prayer list. Um, some other notes, uh, uh, Vacation Bible School starts two weeks from today. Isn't that amazing? Two weeks from today is Vacation Bible School. It's going to run five nights from Ju July 10th through the 14th. Starts on a Sunday night, uh, ends on a Thursday night. And, um, and the uh, volunteer list, if you're willing to volunteer, those lists to sign up are over on that, uh, that register that's over on the north wall there, so you can find them over there. Also, uh, there are sign-up sheets if you're willing to bring a food donation for Vacation Bible School. We, do, we start each of those nights with dinner, with a simple dinner for the kids and their parents if they want to come, and anyone, all the staff members. And so those sign-up li lists for food are on the tables over on this side. So sign up to help over there, sign up for food over here and uh, coming very quickly. Um, also, we're going to be having coffee fellowship uh, every Sunday throughout the summer. Uh, so join us downstairs after worship and, and uh, have coffee and a little treat down there. Um, also, a group of people is putting together snack bags for all of the kids who are going to the Young Life Summer Camp. Uh, if you can help or if you would be willing to make a donation, please talk to Sue Scruggs about that. And uh, also, you mentioned you, you guys are missing a white table that was used, that you brought over here that was used for uh, um, old wheels. And it's possible somebody either took that home thinking it was theirs, or maybe they put it in the wrong closet here and we haven't been able to find it. Because it's not, you've looked through all the ones that are in the closet down there. Okay, it says Scruggs underneath on the bottom. So if anybody, if you took one, if you had one of those tables and you took home the wrong one, maybe, take a look on the bottom and see if it says Scruggs on it. And, uh, and then uh, negotiate with Jim how much he'll pay to get it back. So, <laughs> but, uh, so we're, we're, we're on the lookout for that table. Or if you put a table away somewhere other than in that room under the stairs there, maybe somebody tucked one in in a different room, um, if that rings a bell, 
uh, let us know. So those are our notes for today. If you'd please rise, we're going to begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that as we come and gather together here in your house today, we are also your house of faith. Those all who believe are part of the house of God, which has no walls. And we thank you that we are part of that house through faith in Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us on the cross, and in whose name we pray. Amen. We continue now with our confession and forgiveness on the screen before you. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn today is number 556, 556, a hymn that celebrates God's creation. Morning has broken. Our worship continues on page 138 in the front part of the red hymnal, or the words of our liturgy are on the screen before you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord 
for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God. Sovereign ruler of all heart, you call us to obey you, and you favor us with true freedom. Keep us faithful to the ways of your Son, that leaving behind all that hinders us, we may steadfastly follow your paths. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. First lesson comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 15 through 16 and verses 19 through 21. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael, be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Muhalla, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. So he departed from there and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again. For what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. The word of the Lord. Be Responsive reading for today comes from Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. 
Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The second lesson comes from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him, who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to St. Luke, the ninth chapter. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And I always loved that, that phrase. Uh, once uh, he knew that his ministry was coming to a close and it was time to go to the cross, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He was committed to going to the cross for us. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. And he, when he says, Bury my father, he doesn't mean his father just died and they need to do a funeral. He means, Let me go and take care you know, of, the, of the farm with my family until my father is gone, then I'll come and follow you. And Jesus said, Today is the day of salvation if you're going to follow. But as for you, he says, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. And we invite the kids to come forward for our children's sermon time. All right, come on down. How's everybody today? All right. Now I'm going to say good morning, and if you guys could say good morning back to me, it, it, loud enough to, to wake everybody up, because there's, there's a lot of people here, and there's only a few of you guys. So ready? Good morning. Oh, that'll work. All right. Good to see you guys. Hey, I got a few things I want to show you. Um, see what this is? What is that? Yeah, it's not just any hammer either. It's a Cubs hammer, but it's a hammer. All right. And what, think about what you might be able to do with that. Here's something else. Um, do you know what that is? You probably can't see it. It's a small one, kind of, but you see what it is? Screwdriver. That's right. Veda knows her tools there. And there are big ones and smaller ones. The smaller one I keep in my office to do some things. That also says Cubs on it. Yep. <laughs> Let's see what else I've got in here. Um, I've got, uh, this is something, this is like a, 
you know what this is called? It's like a pry bar. You can pry things off, or you can pull a nail out with it. It's another tool um, that you can use. And uh, let me see if I've got anything else in here. Um, oh, yeah, here. What is this? Do you know what this is? Tape measure. That's right. Yeah, a tape measure is something you use to measure. Now, what might these things all be used for? You know? Huh? Something like building something, right? Yeah. Building something. They could be used in building of a house. And I've got another tool I have back here. I almost forgot about it. Here's another tool that can be used for building a house, although they probably use better saws than this one. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, these tools can all be used to build a house, a real house you know, in the world. And if you have the skills to do that, you have the tools to do that, you can build a house. Did you know that Jesus also has a house? Did you know that? We call the church the house of God, and this building is where we come to worship. But did you know that the house of Jesus is something that doesn't have any walls, doesn't have a ceiling? Did you know that? You know where Jesus lives? You know where his house is in this world? It's in the heart of every one of you who believes in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, Jesus lives in your heart. You are his house. And so all of the believers everywhere in the world, we call it the, the Holy Christian Church or the church around the world, everyone who believes is part of what we call the house of Jesus. Now, how does that house get built? All right, I'm going to put Jesus up here. So remember, we're building the house of Jesus. Now, how does that house get built? Do you know? Well, one of the ways that it gets built is with this. What is this? This is the Bible. This is the Word of God. And Jesus builds his house on the Word of God. So that's one way that the house gets built. Let's see if I have something else in here. No, I've got it over here. Another way that the house gets built is by something that Jesus did. What did Jesus do? He died on the cross for our sins. You see that nail there? there that's kind of like the nails that they put through the hands and feet of Jesus. When those nails went through those hands and feet and Jesus died on that cross for our sins, he was building the house that we would live in because he said, if you believe in me, if you have faith in me and trust that I have died on the cross for your sins, guess what? You're in my house. And anyone who is in the house of Jesus, Jesus says, someday when you leave this world, you're going to come to live with me in heaven. Right now he's inside of us and we can't see him with our eyes. But someday when we're in heaven, we're going to see him with our eyes, aren't we? Face to face. So that's the promise of everybody who lives in his house. And I'm going to give each of you, um, I'm going to give each of you a little thing that has Jesus on the cross. There you go. And I'll tell you what, I'll give you, I'll give you that too. With the, just a reminder that if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, if you believe that he rose from the dead so that you could have eternal life, then you are part of the house that Jesus is building. And what a blessing that is. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you have made us part of your house through the death of Jesus on the cross. Help us to build that house through faith in your word in the Bible. And help us to trust in you throughout our lives so that one day, uh, the Jesus who lives in our hearts, we will see face to face in heaven. We give thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys are welcome to come up here and, and uh, get, get a treat. And we're going to sing our next song, which is Glorify Thy Name.
Well, I continue this morning with this sermon series on the book of Hebrews. The title of the series is The Supremacy of Jesus Christ. And part three today is called We Are the House of Jesus Christ. We are the house of Jesus Christ. And I want to read just a couple of uh, verses for you again. Uh, The writer of Hebrews says, Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in his hope. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, several years ago, uh, Lisa and I took a few days off in the summer and we went up to Wisconsin and uh, God's country, that's where I was born and raised, so God's country, you know, Wisconsin. And one of the things we did on the trip was that we, uh, we went to visit a place called Taliesin uh, near the town of Spring Green, which is a little bit northwest of Madison. Taliesin is a 37,000-foot home that was built by the famous architect Frank Lloyd Wright in 1911. And Wright had been wanting to move out of the Chicago area. He was living in Oak Park at the time. Um, and so, so he started to build this house up, his dream house up in Wisconsin on 800 acres of land that had been owned by his mother's family since the 1840s. And that house is pretty amazing. And in true Frank Lloyd Wright fashion, it is built right into the side of a hill, almost as if it's part of the hill. In fact, that's how it got its name, Taliesin. Wright's mother, mother's family came to the United States from Wales, And in the Welsh language, Taliesin means shining hill. And Taliesin is certainly a shining example of the vision of the man who was probably the greatest architect in American history. Now, I tell you that story because I want to talk to you today about another house that sits on a shining hill. The architect is greater than Frank Lloyd Wright, greater than all of the architects of the world put together. The builder of this house is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the house that he has built is the Holy Christian Church, made up of all true believers in Jesus everywhere in the world. We are the house of Jesus Christ. And it is a tremendous blessing to be a part of this house of our Savior. But with that blessing comes a responsibility. And also with that blessing comes a warning. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is talking about in today's text from Hebrews chapter 3. Now, I've divided the text into three parts, and I'm going to call the first part the greatness of the architect. The greatness of the architect. I heard a story once about three little boys who were playing together on the school playground. While they played, they talked, and they started, as as little boys sometimes do, they started to brag about their fathers. And one little boy said, you know, my dad is a great writer. And the other two said, what do you mean? And he said, well, one time he wrote some words on a piece of paper and called it a poem, and some guy paid him $500 for it. And the second little boy said, oh, that's nothing. One time my dad wrote some words on a piece of paper and called it a song, and somebody paid him $1,000 for it. The third little boy, who happened to be the local pastor's son, said, I've got both of you guys beat. And they looked at him and said, what do you mean? And he said, well, every week my dad writes some words on a piece of paper and calls it a sermon, And then on Sunday morning, he stands up and reads what he wrote on the paper. And when he's done, it takes four guys to collect all the money. (laughs) (laughs) You know, the world that we live in is obsessed with the idea of greatness. Who is the greatest? You know, we call the best athlete of the year the most valuable player. You know, the great actors and actresses are, are awarded with Oscars. People argue about who is the greatest composer of all the time, who is the greatest scientist of all time, who is the greatest military leader of all time. There is a big, thick book called the Guinness Book of World Records filled with the exploits of people who were the greatest in the world at something, even if it was just growing the longest toenails. (laughs) But when it comes to the question of who was the greatest human being of all time, the contest is not even a close one. The greatest human being in the history of the world is the man who was also the architect of this world. He is God in the flesh, and his name is Jesus Christ. In the opening verses of his gospel, the the apostle John calls Jesus the Word, Logos. And he says this about him. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
And he was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, he says. Jesus is the greatest human being of all time, and the writer of Hebrews wants to make that point in the strongest way possible. So what does he do? He compares Jesus to the second greatest human being of all time. He compares him to Moses. Here's what he says. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. You know, the Jewish people had many heroes in their history, but there was none greater than Moses. From beginning to end, the life of Moses was a miracle. When the Egyptians were trying to kill the baby boys of the Israelite slaves, God saved Moses by moving his mother, Jochebed, to put him in a basket and float him down the Nile River. She didn't know what would happen to him, but God did. God made sure that 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 basket went right to the doorstep of the daughter of Pharaoh. And she took that baby in her arms and she raised him up as her own. She raised him up as a grandson of Pharaoh. And that meant he received the greatest, the best education, the best leadership training that was available in the world in that day. And many years later, that education and that leadership training would serve Moses very well when God called him to lead the people of Israel out of slavery. And Moses boldly confronted Pharaoh and he watched as God sent plague after plague on Egypt until Pharaoh finally relented and allowed the people of Israel to leave Egypt. But the miracles continued because after the people had left, Pharaoh changed his mind. And he then went after the Israelites with his army, with his chariots. And the people of Israel were trapped by the side of the Red Sea. But God instructed Moses, raise your staff. And when he did, the Red Sea opened up. And the Israelites crossed on dry ground. And when Pharaoh's army tried to cross the sea after them, God closed the waters on them. And and the greatest army in the world was destroyed. The power of Egypt was broken. Moses then led the people to Mount Sinai. And there they received the law that would shape their nation. God even wrote the first ten laws called the Ten Commandments with his own hand, carving them into two tablets of stone. And God accomplished all of this through the hand of that man Moses. There had never been anyone like Moses before, and there has never been anyone like him since, except for Jesus. The writer of Hebrews says, yes, Moses was faithful in his calling, just as Jesus was faithful in his calling. But he says, Jesus deserves more glory than Moses. And why is that? Because Moses was a servant in the house of God, an imperfect servant. He wasn't a perfect man. But Jesus is the builder of the house, and he is perfect. I read a story recently about a man who was eating lunch alone in in a cafe in Los Angeles, and he overheard two people at the next table who worked together, and they were talking about a a particular computer program, one that I've never heard of, which is not a surprise. But anyway, he heard one guy giving advice to the other guy, and he knew that the advice that was being given was not exactly correct. And so he kind of leaned over and interrupted them, and he said, hey, I happened to overhear what you were saying, and I think I could help you out with that. And the first guy said, well, I've been working with this program for over a year. I think I know it pretty well, so I don't need your help. He said, okay. The guy guy was pretty rude with him. He just let it go. He said, I was just trying to help. Finished his lunch, paid his bill, and he left, and he never told those two guys that he was the man who had created that program. (laughs) that they were talking about. Those two men could have had a conversation with the builder of that program, but they missed out. They missed out because they did not recognize who he was. They did not bother to find out who he was. The writer of Hebrews wants his readers to understand that as great as Moses was, Jesus is greater. 
And we are thankful for the witness of Moses. We are inspired by his faithfulness, but we do not worship Moses. Moses was the greatest servant in the house of God, but Jesus is the builder of that house. And the writer of Hebrews wants us to see, wants us to see the greatness of the architect. Which brings us then to the second part of this chapter. If Jesus is the great architect, if he is the builder of the house of God, then what is the responsibility of the house? What is the house of Jesus called to do? The writer of Hebrews says in verses 5 and 6, Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. In Old Testament times, Moses was God's chosen leader. He was God's servant over the house of Israel. Moses did his job faithfully. He followed God's instructions to the letter, and he led the people of Israel out of slavery right up to the border of the promised land. And when God gave Moses the law on Mount Sinai, Moses did not argue with God. He did not make suggestions to God. I can improve on this a little bit. He received the word from God and he passed it on to the people. The writer of Hebrews says that those laws that God gave to Moses testified to what God was going to do in the future. All of those animal sacrifices, all of those food laws, all of those laws about cleanliness, all of those laws were looking forward to the day when Jesus would die on the cross for our sins. Jesus would be the perfect sacrifice. He would be the clean, unblemished Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. Moses could not have seen what God was going to do. He could not look into the future and see the cross, but he was faithful in doing what God had called him to do. God had given the law to Moses, and Moses put that law into practice, and he prepared the people of Israel for what God was going to do in Jesus Christ. But now here we are. We are living on the other side of the cross. Moses was faithfully pointing to something he could not see yet. But we are now called to be faithful in our day by pointing back to something that God did 2,000 years ago. We no longer have to do the animal sacrifices, which is kind of nice because as a pastor I'd be killing a lot of animals if I had to do that. I'm glad I don't. But... And we no longer have to follow all the, the kosher laws, which is really good too because I love bacon. In fact, I just saw on the news last night that one bacon company, Wright Bacon Company, is coming out for their 100th anniversary with a bacon uh, fragrance. So I don't know what that would be like to have that little bit of that on. Yeah. <laughs> but what is our calling? The writer of Hebrews says this. He says, we are the house of God. The church of Jesus Christ is the house of God, and we are called to do two things. He says, we are, we are his house indeed if we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. So let's look at those two things separately. First, what does it mean to hold fast our confidence? The simple answer is that it means to have faith. We are supposed to live like people who actually put their trust in God. I heard a story once about a man who was flying home after a long business trip, and about an hour into the flight, the fasten your seatbelts sign flashed on, and a few minutes later, a calm voice said over the intercom, we will not be able to serve beverages at this time because we are expecting a little turbulence. Please make sure that your seatbelt is fastened. Those of you who have ever been on a plane with some turbulence know what it's like. It's a little, little unnerving. And so the businessman looked around the plane and he saw many of the passengers were becoming apprehensive. Then a little while later, the voice came back on the intercom and said, we are so sorry, we won't be able to serve meals at this time. The turbulence is still ahead of us. And then just a few minutes later, they hit that storm. Loud cracks of thunder could be heard over the roar of the engines, lightning lighting up the dark skies. And then suddenly, suddenly, that plane began to be tossed around almost like a cork in the ocean. One moment it was lifted up on a current of air, and the next moment they were about to, uh, felt like they were about to crash. <laughs> and as the businessman looked around again, he saw that all of the passengers had a look of panic on their faces, all except for one little girl. 
She was sitting calmly in her, feet, in her seat, her feet tucked up under her, looking at pictures in a book. She seemed oblivious to all of the turbulence around her. Sometimes she would close her eyes and kind of fall asleep a little, and then sometimes she would open them up and start to look at her book again. And finally, they made it through the storm, and when the plane landed, the passengers were exiting, and the businessman passed by that little girl who was still in her seat, and he paused and said, you were very brave on that plane, young lady. Everyone else was afraid when the plane was shaking. Why weren't you afraid? And the little girl said, I wasn't afraid because my daddy is the pilot, and he's taking me home. <laughs> That little girl had so much confidence in her father. And he was only a human being. He could have failed. <laughs> but we can have complete confidence in our Heavenly Father. We know that no matter what the turbulence we might have to go through in this world, our Father is going to get us safely home to heaven. And so that is our first responsibility of, of those who are part of the house of Jesus Christ. We are called to hold fast our confidence and called to live as if we really trust in our Savior. And then the second thing we are called to do is to boast in our hope. Boast in our hope. You know, we tend to think of boasting as a bad thing, and it usually is, or often is, because what do people boast about? They boast about themselves. And that comes off as arrogance. And God doesn't want us to be arrogant. We're called to be humble when it comes to our own accomplishments. What we should be boasting about is what Jesus has done for us. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.31, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul is writing to a church in Corinth where a lot of people were boasting, boasting about their awesome spiritual gifts. I can do this, I can do that, I'm better than you, I'm better than you. And Paul says to them, do not boast about the gifts and the talents that you have, gifts that were given to you by the Holy Spirit, but boast about the God who gave you those gifts, the God who gave you those talents. That's who you boast about. You know, I had a man in my previous church who was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, the highest military award. Um, Alan Lynch was his name. And for the longest time, I did not know. I did not know that. I didn't know. You know why? He never told me. <laughs> he never told me. I heard it from someone else. And, and so then I went and asked him about it. And I looked up his story, too, on, on, on uh, the Internet. And, and when I talked to him about it, I asked him about it, he said, God just protected me and brought me home. He said, the real heroes are the guys who didn't make it back. <laughs> didn't brag about his exploits. And his story is really amazing. It's an amazing, amazing story of heroism on the battlefield in Vietnam. I wrote about it in one of my pandemic pulpit devotions back in 2020. Amazing man, and all he wanted to talk about was his father in heaven and his brothers in arms. <laughs> you know, what is the house of God called to do? We are called to hold fast our confidence, have faith in Jesus, and live that faith. And we are called to boast in our hope, not boast in our own accomplishments, but boast in our hope that comes because of what Jesus has done for us. Now, near the beginning of this sermon, I told you there were three parts of this text. The first part, I talked about the greatness of the architect, the one who built the Christian church when he died on the cross for our sins. And that ar architect, of course, is Jesus. And then the second part, which I just dealt with, talks about the responsibility of the house of Jesus. What are we called to do? You know, we are called to, to uh, hold fast to our confidence, and we are called to, to, uh, to boast in our hope. And now... The third part and final part of the text is a warning. And the warning is this. Do not rebel against the architect. <laughs> Do not rebel against the architect. I was at a conference once, and one of the speakers told a story. He was, he was a pastor who had retired a few years earlier, and he and his wife bought a nice home in Florida. And about six months after moving in, a crack started to form in the ceiling. And over the next uh, few weeks, it slowly moved across uh, the ceiling, and then uh, it, it moved down the wall, one of the walls. And so they called a contractor. And the contractor came out and he repaired the crack and it looked nice again. And about six months later, that crack started to open up again. And so they called the contractor back and he said, I think you need to call a structural engineer and have him take a look at it. And so they did. They found a guy who was nearby, came highly recommended. And when the structural engineer got there, he said, I can't believe it. And they said, what do you mean? 
He said, when the previous owners were building this house, they consulted with me, and I suggested they not build their house on this spot. <laughs> I told them I didn't think the ground here was stable enough, but they went ahead and built it anyway. Now my prediction is coming true. Your foundation is shifting, and there's really nothing you can do about it. The writer of Hebrews is telling his readers, do not build your life on any other foundation than the architect of all creation, who is Jesus Christ. He uses the example of the Israelites in the time of Moses. He writes, do not harden your hearts like in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. The rebellion he's talking about there happened about a year after the exodus. By the power of God, Moses had led those people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, brought them to Mount Sinai. They stayed at Sinai for about a year. And during that time, God fed them with manna, provided water for them. But they were constantly grumbling against Moses and against God. When the time came for them to finally enter the promised land, they refused to go in. They thought the cities of Canaan were too well fortified, that the people of Canaan were too strong. So they rebelled against Moses. They talked about going back to Egypt. And God finally put his foot down. He said, I am tired of this rebellious generation. They shall not enter my rest. And God sentenced them to wander in the wilderness for the next 40 years. He said that everyone who was 20 years and older at the time of the rebellion would die in the desert during that 40 years. And when they were all gone, the next generation would go in and conquer the promised land and enjoy the blessings of God. He says, do not be like those Israelites who fell in the wilderness. Be like that next generation that had faith. They built their generation on the foundation of God's holy word and they followed Joshua into the promised land. And now the writer of Hebrews is urging his readers not to lose faith urging them to build their lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Jesus says in Matthew 7, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. That's what the rebellious generation of the Israelites did and they fell in the wilderness. But Jesus says, instead, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. I pray that we will always be that kind of house here at First Lutheran Church in Princeton, Illinois. I pray that we will always build our church in our lives on the rock of the great architect. And may we always say this about ourselves, we are the house of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Please rise. And we're going to confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated, and we sing our next hymn, number 705, God of Grace and God of Glory.
please be seated for the prayers of the church. Please join with me in prayer. Lord, thank you for this church family that we're all part of and that we can study, learn, and grow in our faith together. We pray for families today who um, recently lost loved ones. Harry Pearson, who lived to be 100, that's awesome. Carol Keller, who's Tanya Keller's mom. Bill Olala, Pastor Bob's hus Barb's husband. April Buchanan's mom, Janine Allen. Sheila Kyle's mother, Donna Height. Our con prayers continue to be with you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for those that are being treated for cancer. We lift up Lauren Cook, Steve Heward, who's Evelyn and Hank Sale's son-in-law, Jeanette Dunn, Matthew Scruggs, who's Jim and Sue Scruggs' nephew, and Mary Willock, who's Gay Kyle's sister. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for others who are undergoing various health issues. Dick Mills, who recently um, broke his ankle and is in rehab at Liberty Village. Ruth Eckloff, who's in failing health. Anna, who's Jackie Pilcher's granddaughter. John Purvis. Noah Morgan, who had surgery after his dirt bike accident. Brad Pearson, the great nephew of Dale Feist, who had a stroke and is in St. Louis, and um, he's only 35, so we lift him in prayer. David Shoblowski with heart issues, and Chester Markowitz, Jackie Pilcher's dad, who has health issues. Lord, please heal these and those that we think of right now. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up um, Emily and Kate, who is celebrating birthdays this week. Thank you, Lord, for the success of our O Wheels um, car show. And thank you to everyone who helped out to bring an old car, tractor, truck, or motorcycle. The food was great. The bake sale was a success. But best of all was the fellowship we shared. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our Vacation Bible School that will be starting up soon on July 10th through 14th. We need kids to sign up, volunteers to help, and also those to help with the meals being provided. This is a great opportunity for kids to grow in their faith. Let us help them through this time. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the various missions and organizations that we um, promote and um, provide financial support for. We especially lift up the Adamows in India, and Mary Lee just came back from a trip there, and she said it was absolutely wonderful. Another child foundation in Romania, and our help with the mobile food pantry. Help us to continue to support these organizations and groups. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, be with and guide the various groups from our church that meet regularly. Keep them focused on you. We remember the LCW circles, the prayer shawl group, the quilters, the men's Bible study, the prayer partners, the library committee, the altar guild, and the various Bible studies and Sunday school, and also our choir that's on leave for the summer. Help us to stay focused on you, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for Pastor Bill and all he teaches us each week. Thank you also for Lisa Shields and all the family does for our church. And a special blessing for their new grandchild. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for those that serve the church in ways that um, are just wonderful. Thank you to Cindy and June for keeping things running so smoothly. Thank you to Jeff for keeping our church so clean and welcoming. Thank you for our musicians, 
Lorraine, Lynn, and Kathy for their wonderful piano accompaniment and leading us in music. Thank you for the choir that is now on summer break and Mary Lee who leads that group. I miss singing in the choir. <laughs> Thanks to Glenn, Tracy, and Rick for the sound system and taping of our services so those that can't make it to the service can watch on, online. Thank you for our Sunday school staff, the church council, and so many in our congregation who help out. Thank you for your service to our church family. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we lift up um, various conflicts that are happening in the world right now. The international crisis between Russia and Ukraine. Please bring peace to this region. We lift up those who are sickened by the co coronavirus. Please help them heal. We lift up the conflicts dividing our country. Help us to unify our nation and help us to work together instead of against each other. Lord, we support our military and we pray for all those serving for their safety. We also pray for those that um, serve in the community like teachers and nurses and doctors, police, firefighters, and farmers, and those that work in stores and, and keep things running so, so nicely in our community. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, hear our prayers and through our study prayer and Bible study, we pray for a closer relationship with you. In his precious name, amen. Amen. Please rise and let us join together in the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And our closing hymn today is number 805, Lead On, O King Eternal.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.